So real quick, I'm just going to ask a few questions. I'm not going to hog Ken. I want to turn it over to you guys and get your questions answered as well. Um, but I did have a couple. So um, it, this one's called An Intimate History. I, I, I think you could argue that a lot of your work is, is intimate or personal. It, it doesn't come across as hitting you over the head right. as Ken Burns's version, version of. Yeah. Um, but, but there is something intimate to it. And, and I wondered if you could address sort of your personal investment in these stories, particularly this one. Well, th this is the first series, major series that I've done that's been on, that's been biography. The biography's been the constituent building blocks of the Civil War, of baseball, of jazz, of World War II, of the national parks, the West, the big series that we've done. But this is the first time that biography has taken up the whole thing. And the reason why we did that is that we understood that to understand what was going on in the ages, that 104 years from Theodore's birth in 1858 to Eleanor's death in 62, you had to know who they were, what happened to them as children, what formed their characters. Theodore Roosevelt loses his wife and his mother on the same day in the same house in Manhattan. February 14th. That's going to change you. That's going to influence. She was a child, sickly child, who had asthma and other afflictions and wasn't expected to survive um, to childhood. He overheard a doctor telling his parents, don't expect him to live that long. So when you look at the huge, unbelievable force, uh, somebody said a steam locomotive in trousers that, Frank, that Theodore Roosevelt was, you can understand what those things are that go into it. That thickly forested interior of Franklin Roosevelt is hugely important. Eleanor went to her grave certain that he never complained once about, uh, about his polio, about the braces or the pain of things. Well, his correspondence with Daisy Sookley, which was only recently given to my collaborator and writer, Jeff Ward, betrays that. So we were getting new versions of them and we wanted to know the motivations. If these people really did influence us more than any other family, and I can make that argument, we want to know where they came from, what sort of circumstances. I've already talked about Eleanor's early biography. Franklin is the most adored child that's ever been brought up. His mother comes down to us in history because Eleanor wrote the story as this dragon lady. But she instilled in her son more confidence and more sort of optimism that we would not be here without that optimism. So I think all of that required that kind of intimate treatment. And so let's talk about that because um, this is a family, all three of them, you mentioned they were, they were all born in Manhattan, all born to privilege, um, best schools, best of everything. And, and yet they are primarily known for, for representing the common good, for, yeah. for, for caring in a, in, a, in a very special way. Why do you think that is, and, and is it related to some of the challenges each of them individually faced in their own way? I, that's a really wonderful and excellent question. Yes, I think to answer the back half of your question, that their empathy is born of certain sufferings that they each experience and each experience in their own way. As Jeff Ward, my collaborator, says, they're all wounded people, and you sort of want to know the dynamics of those wounds in order to understand. But they all arrive. They, Theodore's father, Theodore Roosevelt Sr., was a rich man in New York, and the Roosevelts had been around since the 1600s. Uh, but he had what he called a troublesome conscience, and he became what very few rich people were, which is a philanthropist. If you've ever been to the Museum of Natural History in New York City, that was founded by Theodore Roosevelt's father and other like-minded men of that time who would devote their time and their money to helping society, you know, newsboys aid, uh, you know, orphans home, various um, tenement dwelling, improvement of t tenement life. And Eleanor imbibed that and so did Franklin. And Franklin less so, uh, but then he himself stricken with polio has already absorbed the empathy that's inherent in his wife and now develops his own. So yes, it's all about empathy and it's all about this notion that the drab notion we say in the introduction that the mere making of money is not enough for any person or any nation. And I think what they do is they retool the conception of government to something that every American feels. It doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat or Republican or independent. Everyone, the values shared by everyone are two things the sociologists are telling us, that we believe in fairness and we believe in helping the less fortunate. Those are shared by 100% of the population. So you, both men were attempting to level the playing field T.R. in his time saw that the big trusts controlled Congress and therefore everything worked to the advantage of the rich. It's not just the simple equation, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. That's been around forever and is 
around even more so than it was at that time now. But the idea that you would level the playing field, that, that the individual would be seen as equal under the law, had not happened in the United States. It, sort of the lofty language of the Declaration and, and the sort of more precise mechanical language of the Constitution suggested that, but it hadn't happened, and he helped to equalize that. And then, of course, the foolish... Uh, speculation and complete disregard for the rules that fueled the speculation of the Roaring Twenties created the Depression. And Franklin Roosevelt became the traitor to his class by establishing orders and regulations on those people who had speculated us into the disaster, sound familiar, uh, that we had been in, and uh, would earn their undying enmity to the ends of his days, except that in order to prosecute the second great crisis that Franklin Roosevelt had, the Second World War, he totally reversed course and delivered extraordinary profits to those wealthy to produce the engine of democracy that beat the Hitler and the Japanese. I mean, it was an amazing mustering of forces. And when Eisenhower war warned at the end of the 50s about the military industrial complex, he wasn't talking about something that had built up since last Thursday. He was talking about September 2nd, 1945, when the Japanese formally surrendered on the USS Missouri, uh, you know, that, that those guys didn't want those profits to disappear. And we are now living in an economy still largely governed by the industrial profits that many of the sectors, now feeling old and rusty to many of you, still demand that they get the perpetual wars that we've been involved in without any positive uh, outcomes uh, have been a consequence of those people who had once excoriated Franklin Roosevelt in the 1930s as this traitor to their class because he was taxing and he was putting regulations on markets and, and things like that to even the playing field. Came back to sort of, they would never admit that they loved him, but he had delivered such extraordinary profits to win the war. I mean, if you can just imagine where we are right now in this global community, that on September 2nd, 1945, more than 50% of all the manufacturing in the world took place in the United States. He asked in 1940 for 50,000 airplanes, and they told him he was insane, and he got 50,000 airplanes. <laughs> I mean, you, you, in the order we, we like to celebrate, quite correctly, D-Day and what happened at Normandy Beach, but you know, in the order of importance in the Second World War, what, what decided it was the Russian sacrifice, 20 million soldiers and another 20 million civilians. But their ability to fight came from us arming them. And the second biggest thing is the American manufacturing. Let me try to make a couple connections. You, you talked in, in the introduction about your view of history, how it, it's not what was, but what is, yeah. quoting um, Faulkner, I think you said. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and I think the, the, the value of, uh, of a lot of your work is that it teaches us not about what happened, but about what is, where, what is happening now. We also talked a little bit about empathy and, and, and the common good. I'd argue that, that your, your life work is, is, a, you know, is, is contributing to the common good. But I'm curious about your, your own view. What do, you, what do you see yourself as? I mean, obviously a filmmaker and a storyteller, are you trying just to tell a great story? Or are you trying to educate? Well, you know what, I, I'll be really clear. I'm, I have no interest in putting my politics into the films overtly and making propaganda. I'm not interested in that at all. Um, or even something, an opinion piece. You know, I, I, I do have politics. They undoubtedly get into the films just because you know, there's nothing uh, objective, you know, the only thing that's objective is, and she's not telling. Um, you guys know that, right? Um, but I just want to tell a good story. I am not naive enough to know that it doesn't have educational value. That is to say, today is a school day in America, and the Civil War is being shown, which is 24-year-old film, 2,500 times today. Maybe not today, but, you know, it averages out to that per year. That's an extraordinary thing. Um, and that's very exciting. And also, I understand that history is a table around which we can still agree to have a civil discourse. Like Bill O'Reilly and um, Glenn Beck and Sean Hannity love Abraham Lincoln. And so does Rachel Maddow. So if you've got that, I mean, I formed a nonprofit called the Better Angels Society, which is after the last line of 
Lincoln's first inaugural when he was appealing to the better angels of our nature it didn't happen. Just we had, quoted her. You know, we had a, uh, uh, th yeah, and, and Meacham kindly uh, on his own uh, references it here. Um, that's Lincoln's appeal. That's my appeal. And so I understand that working in public broadcasting where you can do a deep dive into the subject, that you're not interrupted every six to eight minutes by six or eight commercials, that you can actually thank the people that brought you there, Bank of America and the Better Angels Society and the, um, you know, Corporation for Public Broadcasting, whatever it is, and then dive down for two hours and come up and thank them again, which is what you do to your host. Thank them at the beginning for inviting you and thank them for having you over. Um, You've got, a, you've got a platform, and it's a possibility to talk about a vision of the country that may not be what it is, but could be. And I'm interested in that. You know, uh, uh, let me leave that very excellent question with one thing. Is that a lot, I've read a lot on Abraham Lincoln, and he always is better than how he actually was, you know? And we always are suspicious of what's called hagiography, hey kind of hero worship. In, in history, but I, I keep looking. Gore Vidal wrote a novel about Lincoln and he set out to attack him and he couldn't. It ends up being this incredible, and I've always wondered, you know, we always sometimes say the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So the sum of the parts is here and the whole is here. What is that difference, you know? And I realized after a while to stop worrying about it that I understood it that it was our wish for ourselves. And that's an important thing, that, that we invest in other people maybe even something more than what they are in the hopes that they'll be that way. Many of you are not parents yet, but you will be, and that your own children are like that. You invest in them greater things than they are, but you are actually pulling them along in that expectation in a, in a healthy way uh, in that. Sometimes parenting is not so healthy, but you know what I'm Tell saying. I'm interested in that wish for ourselves. I'm interested in the difference between the sum of the parts and the whole. What are your thoughts on, on the future of what you do? You referred earlier to getting lost for an hour on HuffPo. Uh, what does that mean for a for It's You know, when, when the Civil War came out, the critics were saying, this is terrific, but no one will watch it. We're in the thrall of an MTV generation that only can look at things in two-minute mu music videos with really fast cutting, and these are slow. You sometimes have 30 seconds on one photograph. You know, no one will watch it. Still the highest rated program in PBS history. 17 years, oh, and by the way, there were like 15 channels on in 1990. 17 years later, when the war came out, there were 500 channels, and it got almost the same audience, but they were, the critics were also saying, nobody's going to watch it because everybody's uh, doing YouTube, and there's all this internet stuff. In addition to all these channels, no one will know that it's on. And it had almost as great numbers as that. So now I feel vindicated because we now do digest things in that way. Yes, indeed, we get distracted. We've always been distracted. There were movie magazines and tabloid newspapers for as long as this country's had newspapers, you know? And we've got, you know, all the stuff that we're distracted by celebrity and bold-faced names and things like that. But we're also really hungry. And, you know, as I said, you know, these kids line up at midnight for a Harry Potter book that will take them longer to read than any film I've ever made, each volume, and there's seven of them, and we're always rubbing our hands about, oh, everybody's lost. Everybody will waste time. There is a sense that none of us are really present anymore, and that's not a, bad, a good thing, and that we have all of these dreams of the future, and they're mostly dystopian, and they don't work, and that's a real dilettantish waste of time that if you study the past, you can be inspirited in a way that gives you fresh perspective on the present, as we've discussed, but also arms you much, in a much better way for the future. And the great crime is inattention. Mm -hmm. Great crime is inattention. And all, if all meaning accrues in duration, then the, the, I guarantee the relationships you care about and the work you're proudest of have benefited from your sustained attention. It's just lawful. It, it accrues. Something happens, like um, layers on a pearl. You can't just say, oh, that's layer 1700. It's just, it comes. But and a good story, well told, still an appetite for it. Yeah, and it's away. everywhere. I mean, you know, what's the most popular novel right now, uh, you know, in, in mainstream stuff is the, is the Goldfinch, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it's how many pages? Like seven or 800 pages? Mm -hmm. It's people are reading it. And, you know, pe I, the story that I like to tell is with the Roosevelt's is that the Hyde Park, where Franklin Roosevelt has his presidential library, is a National Park Service site. Um, it's got a huge visitor center with a big auditorium. You'd have that the, the 
that would have to be open for 304 years to get the same number of people that are going to be seeing this the first time it's broadcast <laughs> on PBS. And that's terrific. That's great. I unfortunately have to keep you on your schedule. So Thank you I, all. I it's been great. Up. Big warm up. Thank you so much. <laughs>